Thank you, uh, and good morning. It's a, it's a tremendous honor to be here uh, speaking for TEDx Brentwood. I, I graduated from Brentwood, and the single most important sentence that stuck with me as I went through life and my career was, no matter what you do, do what you love. So the title of my talk today is around changing brains, changing minds. Because it was here that I first got to see my very first brain in my, in my biology class. I first got to understand about physics in my physics class, and that became my interest in technology, primarily medical imaging. So I want to tell you why I love the brain, because it really is something for me that surpasses that saying, space is the final frontier. In my mind, and in many neuroscientists, your brain is the ultimate frontier. And the reason is in actually one thought experiment. So when you sit and you think about the complexity of the brain in terms of the number of functional connections, it is actually the case that if you were to go and do the numbers, it's probably the case that there are more possible functional connections in your brain than there are atoms in the observable universe. That fact alone pretty much says why I think the brain is fascinating. But the question becomes, how can you use what you know, what you learn, to make life better? And so the brain and how we understand the brain is changing how we're impacting the lives of everyone, myself, everyone sitting in this audience, and the many, many, many people who use and count and rely on your brain every day. And if something should happen to it, it's not like a broken leg. A brain injury, a brain disease is devastating. So what I'd like to do is just go to my first slide, which right now I'm supposed to have a clicker. Perhaps I can get one. There we go. So I'm going to give you three demonstrations of real life examples of how our knowledge of neuroscience is actually impacting in immediate ways the better medicine that we can give to you. The first, in terms of changing the brain, goes in surgery. So if you want to ask yourself, OK, how do we do surgery and make a change in the brain? Start first with the largest question. Ask yourself this. When you get on a plane and you fly, was that the first time the pilot flew the plane? Probably not. In fact, the pilot was trained on a flight simulator. And we all know flight simulators have been around for many, many years. In surgery and in medicine, simulation technology is only now coming in. So I want to introduce you to Ellen Wright. Ellen Wright helped change the world help change the way that we think about how to treat the brain. Because she, like many, many people, started having symptoms that were uh, related to a brain tumor. Headaches, not feeling so well, nausea. She went to a doctor, they did a scan, and they discovered a large tumor. She was told that it's not an aggressive tumor, so that was a relief. But she had to make a decision of whether or not she would encounter that scary concept of neurosurgery. She had a young grandson, and where the tumor was was where her speaking areas were. So while she wanted the tumor to come out, she definitely wanted to continue to have an amazing relationship with her grandson and her family and be able to talk and laugh, move. She didn't want any critical functions lost. Canada undertook what at one time, the Minister of Innovation said was its number one demonstration of innovative impacts in the, in the current times, which was an initiative called NeuroTouch. And it was a bold idea across the country, over 26 surgical sites in every center, over six engineering sites in the National Research Council, to say, well, let's build a surgery simulator. Let's not have the question to your surgeon, how many times have you done this before? Instead, let's have them practice it in virtual reality. And we picked brain surgery. This picture right here is Ellen and her husband sitting a day after her surgery when the, she successfully 
had the tumor taken out, and was basically discharged one day after. Now that's a really, really important picture. And the reason is, I want you to freeze time right now and roll back. The day before, we were in the operating room theater doing the surgery. And we knew exactly where all her critical areas were, where her language areas were. At that point in time, it had even leaked to the world that this was the first time in the history of the world that someone had had a virtual reality brain surgery before they had brain surgery. So we would take the clock back one more day, and we had the entire OR team practice her surgery while she sat at home. Her brain, her tumor, her unique fingerprint of where language was. It went perfectly. So that night, we got to sit with Ellen, and she asked the first question in the history of the world, which was, how did my virtual surgery go? Imagine if this was you. Imagine if we got to sit with you and say, we practiced, it went perfect. Now, of course, we tried in this effort to catch up with flight simulators. But if you think about it, and I did, it was actually the case that we, in fact, overshot them because this was specific to Ellen. This would be like when I go to get on the plane, the pilot has flown the very flight I'm going to fly and said, you know what, I was going to go this way, but I discovered there's some weather there, so I'm actually going to take a different route. So we overshot it through technology. And in doing so, we changed a very, very important problem around medical errors, medical mistakes, and giving the best possible quality. This also went worldwide, I'll tell you. And it went worldwide because of the science. So everything I'm going to show you in these three slides is the person, and the science. So this is a photo shot from the virtual reality brain surgery simulator. And here are Ellen's critical areas of speech. This is her tumor, her brain, rendered into virtual reality. This shot is remarkable, because what we can do is we can take all these high-end medical imaging uh, shots and actually use mathematics to turn it into a virtual reality physical object. So that shot is actually the surgeon practicing taking her tumor out while she's at home. Now, kind of a weird experience when you're in this sort of field, because shortly after that picture, Ellen got up and started doing brain surgery on her own brain tumor. And I thought that was pretty weird. But it continued because, in fact, Canada, the Canadian press stopped, and we went, this went worldwide to every corner of the world. It was used by Disney to demonstrate the grand challenges in engineering in Washington Mall, and went as far away as Japan and all around the globe. This was how Canada proved Canadian science was making a difference. That's my first example. Now, I want to give you another example of things we're working on where what we do is we take science from the lab and we make a difference in the healthcare you receive. This is a case that will stick with me for the rest of my life. This is Arnie. He's in the picture. He's passed away. Arnie had a major traumatic brain injury. He was driving down the highway like we all do, got in an accident, hit a pole, went through the window, and had a severe traumatic brain injury. The problem is, at that point in time, the world didn't know if Arnie was still there. Imagine if this was you, and the world doesn't know if you're in there. You can't tell them, because all the critical areas that allow you to speak or move or talk, they're not working. But you can still be in there. So Arnie's mom found us, and we were in the lab at the time, and we recorded his brainwaves. And we could record brainwaves that said he's there, just like you or I are. Physiological, objective brainwave data. When I did this test, I did not think Arnie was there. Everything I saw looked like that was not the case. But I still turned to him and I said, if you're in there, we will know. And when we went and looked at his brainwaves, he had responses that looked just like mine or yours. We could give that information to his mom, 
but we didn't get that information in time to give it to the, the clinical medical world to be able to help Arnie. We're working really hard to change that now. And it's come up to the point where we now understand there's a more fundamental problem. Think about vital signs. When you think about vital signs, you probably think about heart, heart rate, 60 beats per minute, blood pressure, 120 over 80. You're all here because you rely on your brain. Do you have a vital sign for your brain function? Do you know if your brain is working the same today as it was yesterday? What happens if you get a concussion? What happens if you start to age and you start to have memory loss? Is that dementia? The world doesn't have a vital sign for how your brain works, but it needs it. So we've worked for over two decades to develop brain vital signs. We've created a new device that is technology that can just go non-invasively on, record your brain's electrical activity, extract critical vital sign that tell us how you're processing. Right now, you're listening, so there's basic auditory sensory. You're paying attention, I hope. So there's basic attention. And you're processing the meaning of the words that I'm saying. So there's cognitive processing. We can extract that in every single person sitting in this audience. And I don't have to tell you that. I've actually shown it to you right here. This is a very, very pretty picture transformed from here. So they, these peaks are blue, these peaks are red. And what's impressive about this picture is one simple thing. This is the number of people in which we saw those peaks. Each small row in this shows that every single person has these vital signs. So what do we do when we have vital signs? Well, immediately, we get it out into the world, and we've flown it around the country for these devastating cases, just like Arnie, because we had to, because we had to get the tool in the hands of the frontline clinical system so that they could know that the people with these brain injuries had higher levels of function than they thought. We then have to face, how do we help people who might be in sports? Brentwood loves rugby. Rugby has concussions. So what happens then? Did your brain change? Was it a significant change? If it was, when does it come back? This measure allows us to know that. And finally, for all of us, when we start to wonder about diseases like dementia, we need to know what our brain is doing in order to know if it's not doing it the same way it always has. So we're working to bring vital signs. And again, the world is paying attention. In fact, actually, I'll just share one story. There's been multiple, multiple media outlets around the country and around the world. But the one story I'll share with you is I woke up this morning, and I saw a Canadian company had just won Wall Street Journal's uh, startup showcase, global startup showcase. And actually, it looked to me a little bit like, kind of like The Voice. It had Will I Am as a judge, and it had uh, uh, the fellow from the Dal Dal Dallas Mavericks. It had a, a huge, illustrious ju judging panel. I said, wow, that's an impressive Canadian company. That company was Mindful Scientific. I'm the founder and the chief inventor. So it was kind of a fun morning. So I want to tell you one last story. And this is a story that's close to home. Because I just showed you how, by changing the way we understand brains, we can change the way minds think about brain injury, and we can give them help. This is Captain Trevor Green. He's online with his wife, Debbie, watching right now. And Trevor Green and Debbie and myself and many other amazing scientists are working to change the way we think about an injured brain. Trevor was in Afghanistan. He was the guy that would go to a village, take off his helmet, and lay down his sidearm with the rest of his platoon, and say, we're Canada. How can we help? And on March 4, 2006, a young man with a crude homemade axe slipped behind him while they were sitting, took the axe over his head, and with all his force, drove it into the top of Trevor's brain. It was, and is, in my opinion, the most um, 
impressive and incredible story of recovery that I have ever seen. Because the world immediately assumed the worst, that Trevor would die. Well, no, he proved that wrong. When he landed back in BC, to his wife, the clinical team said, he's put him in a home and get on with your life. To which Debbie said quite quickly, you don't know Trevor. And they didn't. Trevor is an elite athlete, rower, played rugby, played basketball, force of life, six foot four, journalist, award-winning journalist, incredibly brilliant, powerful force of life. And he proved against all odds that he could recover. First he woke up and he was himself. He had problems moving because of where the ax came. Then he went through arduous, arduous rehab, post-traumatic stress disorder that I can't even imagine. And he forgave his attacker, one of the most powerful things I've ever heard him say. And he says very, very powerful things. And then we paired together and we moved to the science. And we used medical imaging technology to show that his brain was actually rewiring itself. This phenomenon of neuroplasticity, we didn't have to debate amongst each other. We imaged it. We saw the pictures. This is Trevor at the start of the study when we had to use a lift to put him in the MRI. This is Trevor at the end of the study when he was walking with assist four laps of his house. This is Trevor on September 19th when he walked for the first time in the world bionic with an exoskeleton. On Trevor's arm, I think it's that arm, is a tattoo of Everest because what we're doing right now is preparing and training to walk to Everest Base Camp. Trevor was supposed to be put in a home and Debbie was supposed to get on with her life. We could use medical imaging to show he was right. You can rewire your brain beyond what anyone can imagine. So why stop? This is Trevor and Debbie in our lab at Surrey Memorial Hospital. He has a little height difference in his feet. So in order to allow him to stand, we quickly ran for something. And I immediately found the biggest, fattest neuroscience textbook I could. I thought it was very fitting that he stood on conventional wisdom and proved otherwise. He used his brain to change all our minds. I don't go into a single family with a single individual who survived brain injury and not see a picture or a newspaper article of Trevor Green there. In doing what Trevor has done and what we have done to help support him through neuroscience, countless numbers of people who are dealing with injured brains are inspired and motivated. So, in changing brains, we hope we can help change minds. And that is what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you.